Welcome to tonight's lecture at the World Debate Institute as we continue our World Schools Debating Championship workshop here in the summer of 2007. Today to speak about speaker roles in World Schools Debate, we have James Probert. He's head of the Center for Speech and Debate at the English Speaking Union based in London, where he's also the Deputy Director of Education. He knows about the World Schools format. He was a debater and was in the final round of the World Schools Championship in 1999. He's been a judge at the World Schools Debate Championship for the last seven years, and he's done debate training in over 25 countries. One of the leading debate educators of the world, please welcome James Brogan. Thanks very much, Tina. Okay, so today we're going to look at the different speaker roles there are in World Schools. So we're going to look at each of the three speakers uh, on each side who deliver main speeches, and then we're going to have a look at summary speakers uh, at the end. Uh, I just want to say that before I start that I work quite well if I'm interrupted. If you want to ask a question or anything, feel free to just stick your hand up or yell it out, uh, and we can deal with issues as they arise. But there'll also be a chance for you to ask questions at the end. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about we'll be dealing with in a bit more detail later on in other lectures, so things like definitions we looked at and analysing emotion, uh, and some of the things we'll be referring back to what Bayana said earlier on, which was introducing the format. So sorry if we're, if we're going over things you've heard before, especially if you're already, already familiar with the format. The first thing I want to do is kind of characterise the whole debate, because uh, World Schools is a debate where rebuttal is dealt with quite differently to a lot of other formats. It's not essential to rebut absolutely everything, uh, every single point, uh, name by name, uh, that's raised. Um, but engagement and interactivity between the two teams is really, really key and important to what happens in the debate. So I want you to imagine that each debate is a kind of vessel, and it starts off empty, and you can fill it up with a certain amount of let's say oil, if we're making a nice salad dressing debate, uh, and that is going to be your uh, new material. And then you're going to fill up the rest with vinegar, of course the two don't mix very well, uh, and that's so we're going to be able to see clearly where they separate, and that's your uh, rebuttal. So new material and rebuttal. And you're going to be able to see what sort of percentage there is in each of these features as we go along. So it's going to start off with first proposition having totally new material, because obviously nobody has spoken before her or him, so uh, she has nothing to respond to. So that's entirely new material and new argument. And gradually, each one of the speeches from first opposition, second proposition, second opposition, and so on, has less and less new material in it. Until we get down to, uh, by certainly the summary speeches, and probably in most cases the third speeches, no new material being introduced at all. This is entirely now rebuttal dealing with what's gone before. So that's the first thing to say, and that's what we're going to see as a theme as we look at each speech. But then we're going to look at some particular things uh, that each speaker has to do. So we start off then with the first proposition speaker, sometimes called the first government speaker, if the sides are called government uh, and opposition, you could even call them affirmative and negative if you want to. I'm going to stick with proposition and opposition, which is the most usual terminology in the UK, but you can insert whatever you want. So the first thing the first proposition speaker has to do, obviously, is to define the motion. Now in world schools, unlike some other formats, the proposition doesn't have an absolute right of definition. In other words, it can't just say what the debate is about, and whatever they say is unquestionable, and everybody must go with it, and they can't be uh, marked down for, for anything they say. There are certain burdens on the proposition. They have to define fairly, uh, so that means uh, allowing both sides enough scope and enough reasonable arguments to fill three speeches and to have a reasonable go at, at proving and disproving the motion. So it has to be fair. It also has to be a definition that's along the obvious meaning of the topic. Uh, now, I suppose what that means is, what did the audience, or an intelligent audience member who's kind of widely read and fairly international, what did they expect to see when they came into the room? What did they think the debate was going to be about? And finally, you've got to make sure that your definition is set at the level that the motion is set at. So you can't narrow down to a particular area within the motion. For example, if the motion was something like, uh, this house would limit civil liberties to ensure greater national security, you have to argue that as a general principle. You can't say, what this means is we must introduce compulsory identification cards for every citizen of our country, thereby limiting their civil liberties, but also increasing general security. And then move on from there as if the debate is only about the introduction of ID cards. That's an unfair narrowing. And if the opposition stood up and said, yeah, but what about stop and search police powers? What about preventing people from flying in certain uh, times of day or certain areas or certain people or whatever? You couldn't say, well, that's outside the definition. The debate isn't about that. Because the motion really says what the debate is about. And the definition is just there to clarify certain things that are ambiguous in the motion. It's not there to allow the proposition to set a scope of debate, especially for them. 
that's the first thing we have to say. I mean, there are another few things um, which are fairly uncommon, really, in, all, in, well, in, in a lot of formats of debate, which I don't imagine that you'd think would be allowed at world schools either. You're not allowed to place set or time set, for example. Um, it, there are very few formats where you are allowed to do that. But the debate has to be about something that's obviously a controversial issue in a large part of the world today. You can't define it down to just Nepal or just uh, the US in uh, 17... Uh, 76 or whatever, you have to define uh, in a way that uh, it, it makes it a real debate to have in the place and the time that you are. So what else are we going to say about defining? Because it's not just about uh, saying what the motion means in a, in a dictionary sense. In fact, you can generally assume that your audience knows what English words mean and you don't have to describe what ban is. You, know, you sometimes see teams saying, we will ban smoking. Ban means to make illegal or against the law. Smoking means you know, the burning of an inhalation of tobacco or whatever. What you really mean by that is, what's the context of this debate? What's it about, first of all? What's the issue that's at stake? And this might be, you know, there's this big habit in society that some people think it's unhealthy, so we've got to put a stop to it. What does ban mean? Does it mean that uh, it'll be illegal to possess tobacco, illegal to sell it? Does it mean that you're going to increase the age restrictions? Does it mean, you're, you know, what, what will the penalties be, roughly? Are we talking about chopping people's hands off, or are we talking about just fining them? So, although you don't have to come out with some incredibly complex model, you don't have to propose a kind of house resolution or a bill of parliament or something, you do have to more or less say, what, what is the problem we're trying to deal with here in the real world? And what are we going to do about it? And that's a much more useful way of defining and setting up the grounds for debate than, for example, just defining the dictionary meaning of the, of the terms. So just to put this uh, in context again, use some more examples. When we say that you must define the obvious meaning that people expected to see, what we mean is uh, if the motion was this house would use more nuclear energy, you can't say, well, uh, the sun is a massive fusion reaction, essentially. It's a star that, that bangs together hydrogen and helium atoms and it produces lots and lots of energy. And what we need to do is harness this nuclear fission, that's going to, or nuclear fusion rather, that's going on in the sun by building lots of solar panels. And that's going to be our proposal today. Right? That's not the obvious meaning of a motion set on increasing the use of nuclear power. We probably mean civilian plants using fissile material and generating electricity that way. Okay? That's the obvious meaning of the debate and that's what you should run. And if you don't do that, uh, then you are what's called squirreling. Why it's called squirreling, I have no idea. And what it has to do with little rodents with bushy tails, I don't know either. But for some reason it's called that, and that's definitely against the rules. <clears throat> the final thing to say then, and I'm going to use an example to illustrate this as well, is what we mean by um, setting up a, a fair debate, and even going a bit further than that, really, into something that will benefit you as a first proposition speaker, setting up quite a controversial debate, where there's a clear difference between the two sides. This is something that a good proposition speaker and a good proposition strategy generally should seek to do. Because a clear debate between two teams that obviously have very different positions allows you to demonstrate your skills as a debater much better. It allows you to come out with principles that will help to underpin your practical case. It will allow you to be quite sweeping and generalizing in criticizing the other side. It will allow a lot more rebuttal material for you when uh, criticizing their arguments. So an example of this might be, let's say the motion was, this house would increase taxes to pay for more public services. You're probably not going to say, well, we think that sales tax in uh, three states should be increased by half a cent in the dollar, and we're going to use this so that uh, forms can be translated into Spanish as well as English, which is obviously a very important public service. So that's what we're going to do in, in, only in those states where, where Spanish speakers comprise more than half the population. And this will only be done after a referendum, uh, and it'll be exempt on all types of food goods and clothing and books. So you know, what we're really talking about here is hardly a change at all. Well, you know, why bother to propose it then? Why not come out and say, right, we're going to stick on an extra 20% on federal income tax, and we're going to have socialised healthcare across the country. We're going to have free buses. We're going to move to a kind of Swedish model of, um, of social uh, welfare and, and, and handing out lots of money. Now, that's much more difficult to argue. It's much more of a change. But that's why it makes a better debate. It allows you to have bigger, bolder arguments with more principles underlying it. It allows you to say that the other side are you know, penny-pinching, hard-hearted capitalists, while you are friend of the worker and you're loved by your people. Okay? So even if you don't believe it, and remember, of course, debating is about arguing things you don't believe, it's much better for you as a debater to illustrate your, your debating prowess, to choose something where there's a clear difference between the two sides. And that's a really good thing to do as first proposition when you're defining. Okay, so the second thing that we're going to talk about is moving on from that, establishing what your principles are, 
Why are you supporting this motion? Sometimes this is called the team line, uh, and sometimes it's used as a team line. You see teams uh, at the World Championships sometimes standing up and saying, we believe in this motion because, blah, they come up with a slogan in the way that politicians or, or companies come up with slogans, and they repeat that slogan at the beginning and end of each speech, and it lends a real coherence to what they're saying. It makes them look like they are playing as a team. So an example of this is, uh, there are lots of different reasons for choosing, for example, to legalize a particular drug, or all drugs. On the one hand, you could say, look, we understand that the government has laws to protect people from themselves, and they're really good. We love laws that protect people. We like laws about seatbelts. We like laws about signing unfair contracts. We like laws about health and safety and hygiene in restaurants. But drugs are really great. They're a lot of fun, they're not really very harmful, they generate loads of money for the economy. Drugs are an obvious exception to this. We shouldn't have laws against drugs because actually uh, there's no need to protect people from them. Right? That's one way of saying we should, we should legalise drugs. And the principal position there is that drugs are quite nice. Now, it's a totally different principal position in the debate to say, look, drugs are awful. So is dying in a car crash. So is getting all your money fleeced by a dodgy pyramid salesman who you were foolish enough to believe and sign your, your house away to. But it's not really the government's job to stop people doing this. We're not a nanny state. Let people take their own risks, make their own decisions. They've got to take responsibility for themselves. Yes, drugs are awful, but we're not really helping people to get off them uh, by banning them. So we may as well make them legal and, and, and discourage people from taking them in other ways. Okay? They're both proposition lines supporting an argument to legalize drugs, but they're really different. And unless we know what your principles are to start out with, if you then go into specific arguments about whatever, you know, rehabilitation or reducing the power of drugs cartels, and you're not clear about whether or not you think that drugs are good or bad, or consumption is going to go up or down, or should go up or down, the opposition is going to, is going to have a field day with you. They're going to say, what do you really believe? Why are you saying this? Is this consistent? You might not know if your different arguments are consistent with each other, unless you've got those principles laid out to start with. So tell us the area the debate is going to happen in, and tell us why you have chosen that area, what your grounds are to argue from. It will really help you to build up your arguments as well. Okay. The next two things really are getting into kind of the kind of meat of, of, of the debate. You've, you've set the scene now. You've done your, your main job really as first proposer. Now you've got to first of all tell us what are the main areas going to be that your team is going to argue from. And tell us which members of the team are going to speak to those areas. So you as first proposer might be speaking about... Uh, you know, the, um, the economic benefits of a particular policy or the international benefits or something, and the next person might be arguing about the social benefits or the legal benefits or whatever it is. And you, you can be much more specific than that if you like, but I'm just being general now. And you might even, if your third speaker is going to have a point, we'll have a, a look at this a bit later on, you might even uh, want to allocate to them an argument, in which case you have to say that as first speaker on your side. This applies just as much to the first opposition speaker. You have to say if a new argument is going to be introduced at some point later on in the debate. And say roughly what that argument is. Actually, do be more specific than I was just now. Don't just say, my second speaker is going to talk about political benefits. Say, my second speaker is going to show how this proposal will lead to an increase in voter turnout and democracy will be strengthened. So say what the actual outcome is so that the other team and also the audience and judges have an idea of what it is that you're trying to drive at all the way through your speech, even when you're not making that point. So you, you can't be uh, too specific about these things. Obviously not you know, without actually going through the point and stealing all the, the information from your second speaker. And finally then, you would do what we talked about earlier on when we were talking about strategy and structure. You'd give us a quick outline of what your specific arguments are going to be. Maybe give them titles or names or something, and then you'd actually deliver them. And the really important thing to remember, particularly as first proposition, because this is the speaker that most often uh, gets this wrong. I mean, this doesn't happen a lot, but I've seen it happen is to set up the debate and then not actually deliver an argument which, on its own, stands as a support of the motion. So the best example I ever saw of this was uh, a team who, uh, whose first speaker stood up. The motion was, this house, prefers, uh, this house preferred the security of the Cold War to the New World Order. And the first speaker said, right, first of all, I, I've got two points. He said, my first point is, I'm going to explain what the Cold War was like and the kind of security we had there. And my second point is going to analyse what the new world order means and what it looks like, what it, what it, uh, how it impacts on states. My second speaker is going to go on to compare these two things and show why one is better than the other. Okay? They had done what is called hanging their case. Okay? If, you, if your case is hung, then after the first speaker has sat down, nothing has been said that makes anybody in the room any more likely to believe the motion. However beautifully it was defined, however well it was set up, however much we know what your principles are, 
unless you've actually delivered some whole arguments rather than part arguments or early premises or explanatory material or whatever, then you haven't done your job as a speaker. You have to deliver something which says, even if nothing else goes on now, I've given you a reason to support the motion. So don't forget to do that. But that is the final thing that you have to do as a first proposition speaker. That's your final role. Okay, so, first opposition speaker. Now, I'm going to put the first part of this in brackets because it's something you might have to do, and I really, really hope that none of you do in any debate that you ever have. But I'm going to put it in brackets at the start of each thing, now each speaker role that I go through, and that is, you may have to deal with the definition. You may have to challenge the definition. Now, I said earlier on that World Schools doesn't give the proposition absolute right of definition. That's true. It does place quite a lot of burdens on proposition to define in a certain way. What that doesn't mean is that World Schools benefits from opposition teams challenging definitions that are arguable, but just aren't very good. Okay? You have to rely on the judges in the audience to decide that a definition is not very good, or it's a bit narrow, or it hasn't left you a lot of room uh, to argue in a lot of scope. Okay? Your job as opposition is to just hammer what you've been given, if you can. And the chances are, if they try to be clever with the definition, it'll be quite easy to show why what they're claiming isn't right anyway. You can certainly say this definition is very narrow, or this definition is a surprising interpretation of the topic. But unless you really can't argue it, in other words, unless the definition they've given is tautologous, okay, which means self-proving, an example of a self-proving definition that I've actually seen given, I say this is rare, so these are like, this is like the only example, uh, was uh, that the motion was this house believes that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And the definition given of terrorist was someone who fights for freedom. Okay? That clearly makes that debate totally unarguable because by definition the proposition has won. It has defined one term as the other, so of course the two things are the same. So that's one example of a totally uh, tautologous um, uh, definition. Definitions can also be truistic. Um, and uh, if, uh, for example, um, the motion was this house believes that China is going to be the world's greatest power in the 21st century, and your definition was, well, greatest power clearly means who's got most people, who is literally the greatest of the world's powers. China has most people, therefore we win. That's, a, that's truistic. It's not logically true, but it is just factually true. It's kind of unarguable, the way they've defined greatest, that China is the greatest, the most populous country. So that's, that's truistic. That's impossible to argue against as well. Yeah? Um, if you were to challenge the definition or something like that, how, how does the round usually proceed? Because, I mean, most times the proposition isn't quite ready to concede the fact that they've made a few blunders and or aren't prepared to argue something. Like Indeed. So this is why I say that. We'll, 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 we'll look at what you do if you really are stuck. Exactly. Yeah. But let's imagine what would happen if uh, the proposition gave quite a bad definition, but nevertheless still arguable, okay, and there were still things that you could say. Uh, and, and you could still uh, hope to defeat that definition. Uh, what happens if you stand up and say, look, we didn't like your definition of uh, increasing taxes to fund public services as an extra penny on sales tax for the production of more forms. We think you should have said an extra 10% for the provision of free healthcare. Well, first of all, you have to give reasons why your definition is better than theirs. So you have to show why that definition is a perfectly reasonable interpretation of the motion. So you're using quite a lot of your time already to do the job of first proposition. And then you've got to, uh, to attack your own definition. So you have to set something up, kind of hint at what reasons would have been good to give for that. So you have to almost give a first proposition speech. Then you have to argue against it. So you've already quite hampered yourself in terms of the time that you've got to deal with things. Then, as you say, the proposition, if they stand up in second proposition and say, oh, you're right, sorry, yeah, we'll go with your definition, it was much better. Have, have, in effect, lost the debate. I mean, there's very little that they can do to claw it back from that. I mean, the other two speakers in opposition would have to be terrible, and their two speakers would have to be unbelievably amazing in order to swing that, effectively wasting a whole speech, like almost a third of your, of your case, because they've changed definition. So they're very unlikely to do that. I, mean, I can't imagine that a proposition team would ever do that. They'd say, no, 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 our definition is perfectly acceptable. You have to argue that. But they're probably going to spend some of their time arguing against your definition. They're going to spend some of their time shoring up their own and saying why it was a good one and then bringing in more, more arguments. Then the second opposition speaker is going to have to spend time defending their redefinition, showing again why the defense of the first definition wasn't right, rebutting the first definition just to hedge their bets, then continuing the arguments they made against the second definition that they remade. So everything becomes really, really messy. Neither side is prepared to concede because the moment you do, at least one speech and then an increasing number of speeches becomes, they become write-offs, so you're going to lose. So it's a, it becomes a very, very messy game. This is why you should never, ever, ever get into a definitional debate. Because what will happen at the end? The judges will sit there and say, okay, 
Nothing really happened in that except an argument over the definition, and it was a terrible mess. Do I think the definition was acceptable or not? Sometimes judges toss a coin about that. Sometimes judges come to wildly different views because it, it's not a, a huge area in which they can decide. It's a you know, really either or black or white question or, on which there aren't such strict guidelines that it's always obvious. So as opposition, you really are taking your, your victory into your hands, if not your life into your hands, by relying on judges to make the entire decision on the debate on that one factor, rather than trying to add shine the other side in style and argumentation and whatever. So that's kind of a picture of what would happen in a nightmare world that we get a definitional challenge. As I say, in, in other classes, we'll look at what to do. I think probably opposition strategy would be a good place to do this. What, what you do if you really do get an unarguable definition. I mean, the short answer is you try and pretend, you, you pretend to interpret the proposition definition into something that's as close as they gave, but that is arguable, and give them as much credit as you can, and, and try and build them up with it, without making it look obviously like a, a definition, and so try and create a good debate. But we won't go into that now. If there's something arguable that's given to you by prop, accept the definition. Maybe whinge about it if it's really bad, just to remind the judges that it's unfair. But then don't spend too long on that and then carry on and, and deliver some, some good arguments against it. Okay, the second thing you need to do, in the same way that the first proposition established their principled grounds for doing something, you need to establish how you generally view this debate. What are your principles? Why, why are you an opposition team? Imagine that uh, the audience doesn't know that you've been randomly allocated this side because you're in a competition. Imagine that uh, they, they, they think that you've kind of volunteered to come along and speak. You've, you've heard the motion, you've heard the views, and you've thought to yourself, that can't be right, and you've stood up. We want to know as, as, as audience then, what has motivated you to be the opposition team? Why are you standing there, and what are your principles? So, again, to put this uh, in the context of examples, there are very, very different ways that you can approach opposing a particular idea. So let's say the proposition is all for legalizing gay marriage. So you're in opposition, you don't want to legalize gay marriage. What does that mean, though, about the way you view the world? Do you not like gay people? Basically, you don't think that they should have the same civil rights. Marriage is an inherently straight institution, and it's just wrong to think that it, it, it's going to be uh, open to gay people. Or do you think that gay people are great, actually, and uh, they should be allowed to do what they want, but we certainly shouldn't be forcing them into heterosexual norms of, you know, uh, two people in a relationship and, you know, this ridiculous kind of medieval institution that comes with all these trappings of you know, legal obligations that, you know, it was designed for childbearing. This is crazy. We're in the 21st century here, guys. You know, let's have uh, polygamy and, and bigamy and let's have open relationships. And, you know, we don't like marriage at all, really, as a concept. We certainly don't want to have to, you know, burden gay people with this terrible sense that they're going to have to, you know, dress up in, in tuxes and say some silly words in front of a registrar or whatever. So that's a totally different way of approaching opposition to gay marriage. In one, you don't like gay people, in one, you do. And we need to know which of those things you're going to choose to make the basis of your position before you start making your arguments, before you start saying it's impractical or priests will refuse to do it or it will devalue straight people to marriage or whatever. All those arguments could be made under either, under either position, but you need to decide on the principal position first. The other thing, of course, at that stage you need to work out is why actually do you just, I mean, which bits of the proposition do you disagree with? Not just what your principles are, but they've probably said a lot of stuff to establish the truth of, of, of the motion. Uh, and you, not all of that might be wrong to you. Uh, you can disprove a motion by disproving the last uh, step in the chain of reasoning, not just the first. Let's say that the proposition is proposing that the US ratify the Kyoto Protocol uh, and uh, use that as their map for reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, the proposition might have a whole chain of reasoning that begins with a couple of minutes on the fact that global warming is happening, to convince all those sceptics out there. Secondly, saying that global warming is caused by mankind, and there's something mankind can do about it. Uh, and thirdly, that the best way to uh, do something about it is the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the opposition can decide at any point to disagree with that. They can say, look, climate change is absolute rubbish. So we're going we're gonna to tackle you. you know, if it were happening, maybe you'd be right with all the other stuff. But it's irrelevant because it's not happening. You know, climate change is all the time, up and down. Who knows what's going to happen? Or you could say, yep, climate change is happening. Yes, it's caused by us. Yes, we should really do something about it. But Kyoto, what a toothless treaty. Doesn't even bind developing countries, doesn't have anything in it about carbon trading, isn't market-based, isn't enforceable. No, no, no. We need to invest lots of money in technology or plant lots of trees or build clean power stations in China with our own money. Or whatever it happens to be that you think is the solution. So you can agree with lots of stuff and then just disagree with the, with the last bit. You have to decide at which point in the chain of reasoning given by proposition are you going to say, no, 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 the motion says Kyoto, we don't like Kyoto, but we agree that we should do something about climate change. So that's also a strategic decision you have to make, and that has to be said by first opposition, because otherwise 
your, your side of the argument is going to, be, going to become really unclear. Proposition, they're going to have a field day with you in just the same way you would have done in reverse. Uh, if they say, well, come on, what do you believe? Do you believe that global warming is happening or not? And if you stand up and say, oh, well, um, uh, yes, I do. Oh, but um, maybe I still want to make, you, know, you get into a quagmire, it's messy. You need to know from the start. And the audience needs to know. So then the next thing you're going to do, you've established your principal position, established the things you agree with, you've got to do some rebuttal, just some straightforward showing the weaknesses and the problems in the argumentation of the first proposition speaker. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of this, it might be, uh, for example, two minutes of an eight minute speech, you've got maybe two minutes of setup, two minutes of rebuttal, four minutes of new material. All these uh, guidelines are fairly rough. Um, but you've got to spend some time looking at what's been said by first proposition and at least beginning to analyze that and show why it's not true or it, you know, it isn't well supported or its reasoning doesn't make sense. But moving on from that, you may want to then begin to produce constructive material. Most oppositions will not just take everything that's said by the proposition and show why it's wrong, but they'll also have a positive case line of their own. Now there are two ways you can go about building a positive case line. The first thing you can do is think, right, let's imagine that we were the proposition team. And the motion just reads the logical opposite. Maybe we'll put in the word not, or take out the word not, uh, so it reads the opposite. So this house would ratify that this house believes the US should ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Imagine that the motion is this house believes the US should not ratify the Kyoto Protocol, and you've got yourself a proposition line that you as opposition can, you can uh, come out with a, a positive line of argument for reasons why, in a totally standalone speech, the US shouldn't do that. So they don't have to be directly responding to anything the other side has said. They are just their own reasons. Their own reasons why it would be a bad idea for the US to ratify. So that's a kind of simple, fairly straightforward, constructive opposition. If you're going to do that, you need to do the same things that first proposition did. You need to lay out your team division. In other words, which speaker in your team is going to do with which points. And then you need to lay out your own speech structure. You need to go through your arguments. And again, remember to deliver some actual arguments that are supporting your side of the motion. There's a second, slightly more sophisticated, but riskier thing that you could do as an opposition. You can do this as well as having a constructive line. And that is to go a bit further than just opposing what has been said by presenting some reasons why it's a bad idea as well as uh, dissing the other side of it. To go further and actually present a whole new policy as if you were a proposition in a policy debate and you were going to propose an action. Not the action in the motion and not the logical opposite of the action in the motion either, which is often no action but an actual new thing okay, that you're going to do. So an example of this might be, uh, the proposition is saying, uh, let's repeal the Helms-Burton laws, okay? the, the laws that impose sanctions from the US on Cuba. The opposition could say, no, 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 we should keep sanctions on Cuba because you know, the following good reasons. So no change, please, and this is why we think there should be no change. That's just a normal constructive opposition. The opposition, however, could go further. They should say, look, you think we should repeal the Helms-Burton laws. We think we should overthrow the Cuban government. We think we should have an invasion. We think we should be stricter, impose more sanctions, whatever it is you want to do, come up with some policy. So that's a, a much kind of wider way to approach a debate. It can make your position much, much stronger. It can create more of a difference between the two sides. What you've really got to be careful of is make sure that what you're proposing is mutually exclusive with what the other side is proposing. Because if the other side says, we should legalize drugs because at the moment uh, people are getting real uh, you know, addictions and we get, there are terrible problems resulting from drugs and we need to legalize them to deal with those problems. And you say, no, 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 we shouldn't legalize drugs. We should educate people about drugs. We should spend lots and lots of money on educating people and that way they won't get addicted. The proposition says, yeah, all right, we'll do that too. What a good idea. We'll legalize them and educate people. Double that, we'll get double the benefit. The opposition is suddenly left with nowhere to go because what they were saying didn't mean that the motion was necessarily wrong. Now, if you said that you were going to tighten sanctions on Cuba and possibly assassinate Fidel Castro and his brother, then you, you probably are saying you know, that, that that is not compatible with relaxing the Helms Burton laws, you know, and open, well, uh, opening the Cuban government to you know, uh, welcoming them with open arms and stuff, and, and shipping lots of trade to them. So that's probably fine. But you also need to think about whether or not it really is going to strengthen your position, whether or not it's going to take so much time to deliver, whether or not it's just too complicated to propose this, as well as opposing the other side. In some debates, uh, counter-propositions, as they're called, work. In other debates, they don't. That's a decision you have to make. Unfortunately, debating is not like baking bread. It's not just a simple matter of following the strict instructions in advance. You have to play it by ear. 
Um, but that's something to bear in mind. Whatever the situation is, check that what you're saying logically excludes the motion being true. Otherwise, you're going to be in serious trouble. OK, so that's first opposition. So we've now had the first two speakers, and they've really got uh, some fairly big, specific jobs. That's not to say that they have more to do than the other speakers, but there's more in advance you can say about their specific roles, because as we've said, those jars now are filling up with the rebuttal liquid, whether that was oil or vinegar, I forget, whatever it was, uh, are becoming more and more rebuttal heavy. So we're moving on now to the second proposition. So we've had eight minutes of new material in the uh, first proposition speaker. We've had four to six minutes of new material in the uh, first opposition speaker, depending on whether there is um, a counter proposal or how, how much constructive opposition you're doing. In second proposition, we're looking at maybe two to four minutes of new material and four to six minutes of rebuttal. Again, depending on how much you've got to say, how much has been said by the other side. Brackets, as second proposition speaker, you may have to deal with the definitional challenge made by first opposition. Close brackets, let's hope that doesn't happen. Fingers crossed. Let's move on to proper debating. Uh, so, first thing you have to do is you must deal with the main arguments that were presented by the first opposition speaker, particularly if they've presented a constructive case. Even if they haven't, you need to defend your teammates' arguments against the attacks that were, that were made on them by first opposition. But if first opposition has presented a constructive case, you have to rebut that. It's the first job as second proposition speaker. Then you're going to go, along, go on and fulfil the promises that were made by your teammate. The first speaker said, my second speaker is going to speak about X, Y, and Z. So you must then speak about X, Y, and Z. Make it clear that that's what you're doing. Maybe refer back to the fact that your speaker said this. Make it look like you're in a team. Make it look like you know what's going on. So you're going to both defend your teammates' arguments, attack the first, uh, op uh, first opposition's constructive material, and then make uh, your, own, uh, your own arguments. Now, there are different ways that you can structure that. Some people do each of those things in turn. They say, first of all, I'm going to look at the rebuttals that first opposition made and show you why they were wrong. Then I'm going to rebut their case. Then I'm going to go on with my case. Some people lump all rebuttals together and say, first of all, I'm going to deal with generally what was said in first off. Then I'm going to do my own case. Other people, and this can be more sophisticated, but again, like all more sophisticated things, it's a bit riskier, say, look, there are three points that I want to make, and each of them deals with things that first opposition has said. Each of them contains rebuttal or defends my teammates' points. So you weave it all together. So you only have a structure of three things, rather than like two structures of three things. It depends you know, how confident you are in doing that. If you're going to do that, make it really, really obvious that you have actually rebutted uh, and that you have dealt with the things that first opposition said. If you're going to interweave it, you can call it, interweave it with your own points. So you can do it separately. You can do it together. Totally up to you. There's no hard and fast rule about that. I guess probably, statistically, most people have rebuttals separate from their own main points. That's the, the thing you most likely see. Start off with that, see how confident you get in tweeting it into your, into your main points. The final thing that's worth saying about the second proposition speaker is that they're in quite an interesting position. They know what the shape of the debate is, because we've had the principal positions of both sides laid out. But there's quite a lot of time yet to come from the other side. So if they want to lay out a challenge to the other side, they're in quite a good position to do so. If they want to say, look, opposition, fine, we understand that your, that your position is um, that we should massively increase taxes, we should really uh, provide lots more public service, um, and then that's a really fair thing to do in society. But what I want to know from your next two speakers is, can you give us any examples of where this has actually worked, where this has made people richer? Okay? That's going to be my challenge to you. That's our position. And what you're effectively saying as a second proposition speaker is, look, looking at where both sides stand, we're not going to say we, we want to be nasty to people. We're not going to say we don't think people should get healthcare, but we don't think it works. You know, it's a bit like a, a second restating of principles in the light of what's being laid out at, at the top of the table. So you're saying to the other side, tell us if this is really the case. Tell us how it works. Support this. Okay? That, that's a really hard thing then for opposition to deal with. You've kind of captured a lot of the ground in the debate. You've laid out a challenge. You've said you must answer this if you're going to disprove what we've said, and that makes you a very strong second proposition speaker. It gives you quite a lot of leverage over the rest of the debate. And the more you can shape the, the remainder of a debate, the more weight your speech has, the more impact it has. So the higher up the table you are, in some ways, the less impact you have because you don't know what's going to come next. But if you can influence what comes next, then you are a more powerful speaker. So that's something the second proposition speaker can do probably more than any other speaker. I mean, all the speakers can do that to a certain extent, but that's a particularly good position for me. 
Okay, so we move on to second opposition. The two positions now, as they pair up, tend to get more and more similar. So first opposition had a lot in common with uh, first proposition. Um, the two second speakers have even more in common. Again, you've got to deal with the definitional clash of relevant brackets. Then you've got to deal with the things that were said by second proposition. If they've laid down a challenge, you certainly have to try and answer it in some way. Either show, either kind of answer the challenge, you know, give them what they want, uh, or show why it's not relevant, why it's misleading, why it isn't the question that needs to be asked. Because often it, it's going to be the case that you can't give any examples that the proposition has asked for. It's probably why they asked for them, right? And they're not going to ask you easy questions. So you need to think, ah, is this a question that I can answer and make the proposition look stupid for asking it? Or is it a question that I can make them look stupid just for asking? Because it's, a, you know, it's not the point of the debate. So you've got to deal with challenges laid down. You've got to do a bit of direct rebuttal. If they've just come out with an extension of their speech, you've got to deal with that. And then if you do have... Uh, new material to deliver, you're probably going to as a second speaker, even an opposition, then come out with your, your main points. But those constructive points that, that have been flagged up by your first speaker, your kind of team leader is in the opposition, should only be taking two, maximum four minutes a, a, as a second opposition speaker. You need to be spending at least half your time dealing with challenges and rebuttal of the other side's points. It may be more than that. It may be more than half your time. Because what's going to happen then is we're going to get round to the third speakers on each side. Now, sometimes third speakers have really, really small constructive points that they've been given by the first speaker on each side. To be honest, very often they don't. Uh, I would say in about 75 to 80% of cases, third speakers don't have any new material to deliver to the debate at all. And if you do, it should only really be one or two minutes of new argument. And it should be quite an insignificant argument. It shouldn't be something on which you know, the whole of your side rests. It shouldn't be something that's fundamental to your principles. It should be a real add-on, side benefit, something that's nice to say about the motion. Because really what you're doing in the third speaker position on both sides, because they're pretty much uh, identical positions, with, with one exception I'll go on to in a second, is taking a really fine tooth comb to the detail of what the other side has said, analysing each of their points, and showing at some length, and really allowing yourself to, to you know, deeply rebut and really deconstruct their arguments, showing why they're wrong. Because you don't often get a chance to do that in a lot of debate formats, to spend a lot of time, we're talking about six or seven minutes now, on rebutting possibly just three main arguments. So that's like the whole length of time that you might spend in making a whole constructive argument. You can spend in deconstructing them. And that's a really, really powerful uh, thing to do. It's a really powerful period of time. Because you can, piece by piece, dismantle what the other side has said. And you can introduce all the new material, all the new arguments, and all the new reasoning that you need to destroy their case. In fact, you have to introduce them all as the third speaker, because there is no more debate left after you. There are summary speeches, as we're going to see later on. Summary speeches aren't really part of the debate. If you want to win the debate, you've got to win it in the third speeches. You've got to show there why the other side is wrong. Bring in there all the new reasoning uh, uh, that you need in order to support uh, what it is that you're saying in order to disprove the other side. So it's really thematic rebuttal. It doesn't have to be point by point. You don't have to go through one, two, three, four, five, six, the various little subpoints made on the other side. You can look at the, the areas, the premises, perhaps, if they've made a logical argument, that need to be destroyed, and destroy them. What you're probably not going to do, though, and this is particularly true of the opposition summary speaker, is if you are going to go for the thematic rebuttal approach, you're probably not going to take a big stepping back overall view of the debate and compare your themes of constructive argument with their themes of constructive argument and, and use that to show why you've won. You're, you're just going to go straight into the kill. You're just going to say, in the theme of whether or not higher taxes are going to lead to more equality, this is why they're wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Rather than saying, in the equality issue, what did we say? And why is that? Well, because, as third opposition speaker in particular, it's not kind of true for proposition as well, but more so for opposition, you're followed immediately by another opposition speech. And it's a summary speech. And as we're going to go on to see, it would look quite similar to your speech if you were doing a big kind of magisterial opening. So that's all there is to say really about third speaker. I said speeches don't become any less important, but there becomes less to say about them in a, in a role sense because their roles become more and more dealing with what went before, and there's less that you can say about that because you can't predict it. So a lot of rebuttal, six to seven minutes, possibly even eight minutes of rebuttal in those third proposition, uh, third opposition speeches. 
Right, finally then, summary speeches. The most unusual feature of this format, because loads of formats of debate don't have separate summary speeches, they're not delivered by one of the previous speakers, they're not a different length, whatever. So summary speeches don't have points of information in them. Uh, they are considerably shorter. They're only four minutes, so they're half a length of main speeches. And they're made by one of the first two speakers from each of the other, from, from each of the sides. So they'll come back and they'll have a little, little encore at the end of the debate. And I say at the end of the debate, and what I mean by at the end of the debate is after the end of the debate, because this is the first thing I want to emphasize, to understand what summary speeches are and what they should be like. They're not in the debate, they're looking back at the debate. If you haven't won an argument, you can't win it in the summary speech. If you've forgotten to make an argument, or forgotten some brilliant piece of reasoning, you can't bring it in in the summary speech, because the debate has already happened. Summary speeches purely and totally deal with what has happened before. They are like a biased report, a biased newspaper editorial or something, or a kind of a Fox broadcast or whatever. They're, they're, they are saying, what happened here? We had a clash about policies. We had a clash about whether or not climate change was happening, and the following things were said, and you can clearly see from the following things being said in speeches one to three, that climate change is not happening. Okay? You're not making the argument that climate change isn't happening. You're reminding people that arguments were made that climate change isn't happening, and they were by far the best arguments. So you're really grouping together everything that happened in the debate. You're not individually rebutting points. You're probably not even using the structures that we used earlier on in the debate. A really good summary speech comes up with a whole new structure, a whole new way of looking at the debate that brings together things that have happened on both sides and just looks at the areas the two sides really disagreed in. It doesn't bother to go through all the stuff that was not very important or put to one side or they agreed on or they perhaps they agreed to disagree on and, and actually it sort of you know recognize it wasn't relevant you're just going to focus on the clash of the debate yeah but can you use the team line in, in your reply speech do you mean repeat the team line that's come yes. out earlier on the, the principle line absolutely yeah i mean in fact it's it's at that point that you really want to wrap up and remind people of what your principles were and those big principle clashes that came out earlier on in the team lines are going to be important so you can repeat arguments that we used earlier on um, and, and you can, and this is particularly true of the proposition summary speech, if you want, bring in some new evidence to re-support an earlier argument that was made or an earlier rebuttal that was made. Okay? So that there is an opportunity, because if you think about it, the proposition summary speaker comes after 12 minutes of opposition speeches, and one of those was a potentially slightly constructive speech. I mean, that's why we really say that probably you shouldn't have any constructive material in your third uh, opposition speech. But a lot, a lot has happened anyway, even if there's been no new constructive material. A lot's happened in that 12 minutes. So we do allow a bit of leeway for the uh, proposition summary speaker to do um, a bit of shoring up of rebuttal. They can't do new arguments, but they can you know, perhaps use a, a new bit of evidence, for example, to back up what's already been said. But they, like the opposition summary speaker, are wanting to step back, say, what happened in this debate? And kind of walk the audience through it and show the audience why, given what happened, your team line triumphed, your principles were right all the way through, your principles were affirmed. And you can really allow yourself some flourishes of rhetoric and some great lines and some, you know, you're not going to be interrupted, you're certainly not going to go into much detail because you haven't got a lot of time, you're just referring back to things that have already happened. So you can allow yourself to come out with some really quite good sounding sentences, maybe you thought of in advance or that are your team line, uh, that make people think, oh yeah, great, that's, that's a principle I want to buy into. Gosh, they were right, they really did show why, you know, Taxes always harm the, the poor, whatever it happens to be. So you come to the end of the kind of overall debate, not just the debate of the three speeches, but the summary speeches as well. Those are essentially the roles of the speakers at world schools. As I say, they imply a lot of other things, how to do rebuttal, how to use points of information, which I haven't spoken about because it's going to be a whole session on that, uh, and how to uh, summarize and how to thematically group things. So I'm not going to go into those skills in any great detail now because that's basically the rest of the course. Uh, 